Let me send the person in. All right, I'm gonna spotlight Jack here. Actually, I'll leave it here for now and then we'll, we'll spotlight you in a moment. So hi everyone and welcome. We're really excited to have you for today's uh, Spencer webinar, 10 Best Practices for Career Success, presented by Jack Gibson, who's president and CEO of the International Risk Management Institute or ERMI. My name is Rachel Liebline Gerbala. I'm the programs manager at the Spencer Educational Foundation uh, and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I first off wanna just give a brief introduction to Spencer and what it is that we do. So our mission is to fund the education of tomorrow's risk management and insurance leaders. Um, and we do so through scholarships to students, through internship grants, uh, and grants to universities for experiential learning opportunities and RMI curriculum development. Um, and I just want to give a quick plug for all those students in the room. If you're interested in pursuing a career in RMI and you're interested in uh, applying for a Spencer scholarship, our application will be opening on October 1st. Uh, so I hope you consider applying. I have a couple of housekeeping notes before we kick off. The first is that this meeting is being recorded, so you know. Um, I do encourage you, uh, if you're able, to turn your video on. We don't care if you're in your pajamas, if you're at home, if you're walking around campus. We love to see faces, uh, but no pressure if you're not able to do so. Um, second thing that I wanted to mention, or third rather, is that we will be, hi Jason, hi Sarah, awesome, so nice to see you. Um, so, so the thing that I wanted to mention is that Jack will be entertaining questions and answers throughout the presentation. Um, so you can feel free to either raise your hand through the reactions button or type your question into the chat um, and I'll send those Jack's way as we go. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to our speaker today, Jack Gibson. Jack, as I mentioned, is the president and CEO of the International Risk Management Institute, or ERMI. He majored in risk and insurance in college at the University of Georgia, where he also earned his MBA and completed the CPCU program, all while playing football for UGA, if I'm correct, Jack, yeah? <laughs> Oh, I didn't play. I just watched. Ah, yes, yes, yes. There you go. <laughs> um, so he began his career as a risk management consultant in Dallas and then left consulting to join the ERMI leadership team uh, that built the company into the premier risk and insurance education, information, and conference organization that it is today. Uh, through Jack's initiation, Ermi ultimately acquired a dot-com startup called WebCE, uh, and he built, helped build it into the largest insurance continuing education provider in the country. And so he currently serves as CEO of both of those companies. And with that, Jack, we're really looking forward to hearing from you today. The floor is yours. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Rachel. I, it's great to be here. And, you know, you failed to tell me I could wear my pajamas. But uh, that's my probably apologies. Okay. I let that detail slide. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody would want to see me in my pajamas. Um, but I'm really excited to be here today to share some ideas for maximizing career success. And I understand we have uh, predominantly student students in the in the audience, as well as some people who are maybe at, at the early stages of their career. And I, I see a few people that are further along as well, like my buddy Dan Kugler there. Uh, good, to, good to see you, Dan, almost, although your camera's not on. But um, anyway, it's, it's, it's great to be here for that, for this. And, and um, so I'm going to make this, I want to make this an informal chat. There's not going to be any death by PowerPoint here, I promise. Uh, so uh, I'm... Fortunately or unfortunately, you're not going to see PowerPoint. You're just going to have to uh, uh, look at me for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour or, or so. Um, so as, as um, Rachel said, feel free to ask questions anywhere along the way. Uh, or if you have some suggestions uh, along the lines of any of the things that I'm talking about, feel free to, to make those as well. Um, so I'm gonna go through 10 best practices or tips or whatever you wanna call them uh, for maximizing the possibility of career success or doing well in your career. The way I came up with these uh, is through a number, number of avenues. Uh, several years ago, I moderated a panel uh, at a young uh, leaders, insurance leaders conference uh, and and, and working on with that panel, I surveyed them and developed a list of what they considered to be best practices. 
And then I have a few of my own and I've kind of scrambled all these up together and, and came up with 10 best practices. Uh, so I'm just gonna walk through them. They're in no particular order. Um, not, I mean, maybe a little bit of a particular order, but not much of one. And uh, we'll go through them and talk about them. So <clears throat> my number one is make a great impression. And if you think about it, you make an impression with people every time you interact with them, whether it be in person, on Zoom, uh, on the phone, text, email, whatever it might be. Uh, you make an impression and you want it to be favorable. Uh, and you want to develop in others a sense of trust and confidence in you. Um, and probably the most important point at which you can make an impression is that first impression you make, because studies have shown that your first impression is often one that sticks with people for quite a while, and it's kind of hard to change that first impression. So always keep that in mind. So what are some ways to make a good impression? Well, um, and I'm gonna talk primarily uh, in an in-person um, interaction here. <clears throat> well, first off, start with professional attire. You know, in the old days when I started in this business, um, it was easy because all I had to do is wear a suit, a coat and tie. We wore that, believe it or not, every single day to work. And uh, I remember when I started, I was told you can, uh, you need to get at least two good suits and they could be any colors you want as long as they're navy blue or gray. And so uh, that's what I did. And, um, and that was easy. These days, uh, offices and business has gotten more casual. So it's a lot more difficult to determine what to wear to be professional without overdoing it. Um, so my guideline there, my thought would be to emulate your boss and others in your office. Uh, so when you go to work, look around and see what other successful people uh, in your office are wearing, and in particular, what your boss and maybe your boss's boss is wearing, and try to emulate that when you go shopping and buy clothes for yourself. And then let's talk about when you go to a conference or a a luncheon or any kind of an industry meeting for a second. <clears throat> when you do that, I would suggest that you dress certainly at a minimum at the level that you expect others to, to be dressed at that event, but you might even wanna consider dressing just a little above where you expect others to be uh, dressed so that you can you know, just assure that you're gonna make that good impression. And then with respect to clothing, I guess the last thing I'd say is remember that not all clothing trends are appropriate for work. So we have trends that are, are real appropriate for casual when you're going out, uh, say, to a nightclub or to a party or just to, for a night out with friends or whatever. But those are not just because they're um, the current style and trend doesn't mean that it is appropriate for work. Generally speaking, you should dress more conservatively at work than you would for a night out with friends. And I'll just give you one example I can think of uh, um, that, that I ran into not too many years ago with a young lady that was working for our company. And one of the things that ERMI does is host large educational conferences when there's not COVID going on anyway. And uh, we were uh, having a conference in Seattle and this is a really bright young lady. It was her first time she'd been to uh, one of our live events. And um, she's very attractive. And she was dressed attractively, but her, her skirt was much too short for that environment. And <clears throat> for me, being a man, it was kind of hard for me to say anything to her. Fortunately, one of the other ladies said, you know, you might want to, uh, if you have one, wear a longer skirt tomorrow. I think you'll look more professional than, than you do dressed. You look great, but not professionally great. So uh, that would be a, an example of that. <clears throat> Jack, do you um, mind if I ask a quick question? 
Not at all. Go so for it. For those on the line who may have never been to a professional conference or may mm -hmm. not have family members who work in the industry or have ever experienced what sort of that wardrobe looks like, what do you recommend in terms of, you know, figuring out what you should add to your closet? Oh, boy. Well, again, I think it depends on where you are in, in the particular environment. Some companies are more formal than others. So in terms of, uh, you know, when you, in a business setting, I think you almost have to, to find out the particular, if you've not ever been to the company before, you need to ask some people, frankly, you know, what is the standard of dress around there? And I'm talking about before you ever go. If you're going there for an interview right out of school, I would suggest wearing a suit or, you know, very professional clothes most of the time, unless they tell you to come business casual. Um, so if it is professional attire for a guy, that would be a suit, maybe for a woman, a suit, uh, nice clothes like that. If it's um, um, business casual, typically what I would wear in that setting, uh, particularly in most cases would be a pair of slacks, a sport shirt, similar to what I have on here today and possibly a sport coat. And, you know, you can't go wrong on sport coats, in my opinion, with the two colors I mentioned before, navy blue and gray. Uh, although it's, I think, okay these days to, to spice it up with some others, a tan or, or whatever, and, and maybe a, a subtle pattern in it. Um, but again, that's going to depend on where you are. Certain parts of the country are more formal than others, and certain companies are. So, uh, um, you know, often I think in this day and age, a lot of companies that are business casual, the sport coat goes away, and and you know, it's a sport shirt and and slacks. So it's there's so much variety. It's hard to answer that question. But if you're talking about, say, going to the RIMS conference, let's say you're one of the Spencer uh, designees uh, from Gamo to Sigma or whatever that's going to the RIMS conference, I could tell you there that you won't go wrong wearing a you know, very professional attire, such as a suit and coat and tie for a guy. And I'm not as good at pinpointing the women's attire as, as I'm sure some of the professional ladies on the call would be. But uh, but even a, you know, a suit, uh, whether it's pants or a skirt, and a jacket and a nice blouse um, would be the way to go at, at an event like that. So does that help? Yeah, that's great, Jack. Thank you. I think it sounds like the bottom line is if you have questions, it's always great to reach out to your mentors, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about mentors in All a few right. minutes. So I'll that's good. One. And <laughs> I would you. be happy to hear if any of the ladies on the call want to interject particularly what any advice they have. Sally, go ahead. Yes, I, we are back in person for the first time since March of 20. So um, I really enjoyed my, my trips to the refrigerator. So I'm a couple of sizes larger than, I, <laughs> it's not a big deal. It's just my clothes don't fit like they did two years ago. I have had a very hard time finding business casual attire because I think a lot of the buyers thought that we were gonna be in a pandemic. So there's a lot of yoga pants, there's a lot of casual attire and it's, there's not a lot of in between. I've been to several stores the past few weeks and I really haven't found anything. So it's kind of hard on our end to find things. Now, my husband has gone back to work. So we went to the men's warehouse. And if you are a college student that is looking for a sports coat or a jacket or any kind of pants, the men's warehouse, if you have one nearby, is a great place because they have a lot of sales going on. We got a sports coat for him for probably $40 and pants for $30. So it's very affordable and they measure you. So you know exactly what your size is. So that's kind of my advice just to, after the pandemic, things are different, but you still need to have a sport coat and a nice business suit, just one business suit if you're a woman, just, just one is all you need. You can just change out your shirt underneath. That's good advice. And, and men's warehouse is a good suggestion. Um, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, that's close. I'm still on uh, uh, make a good impression. My next point would be to be an active listener. Um, and by that, I mean, for example, at a, at a meeting, when you're introduced to someone, focus on their name when you're introduced and remember their name. Usually in this, that type of situation, what most of us tend to do is we start thinking about what am I going to say next? 
it's better to focus on their name. And then what I like to try to do, try to remember to do is use their name in a sentence right after they're introduced. So it would be something along the lines, well, oh, Rachel, it's so nice to have met you. And, uh, you know, and then the next thing to do is start asking them questions about themselves. So if you, people like to talk about themselves. So if you ask them questions about themselves, you know, Rachel, what do you do? What's your position? How long have you been with Spencer? Those kinds of things and get them to talk. What are your hobbies? Any of those kinds of questions. People will walk away from that conversation much more impressed with you than if you sit there and tell them about yourself. Um, so uh, that would be my suggestion on being an active listener. And then what's really cool to do is if you can remember some of those facts, if you get a business card or something, jot a few of them down. And if you can pull them up and, and, and relate back to them some of the facts uh, in a future conversation, that will really impress them. So I had a business dinner last night with the CEO of a company that's a, a business partner with Ernie. And he started asking me, he knows that one of my, in fact, my biggest hobby is scuba diving. So he started asking me about scuba diving. I thought he remembered that from a previous conversation. And I was pretty impressed that he did that. And we had talked about sharks and things like that. So uh, uh, that's a very effective technique uh, uh, for making a good impression on people. <clears throat> My next thought with respect to that is to follow through on any promise you make uh, because doing so you'll develop trust from those people. So if you meet someone and you promise to send them something or, or whatever, uh, make sure you follow through with it. And then a couple more quick tips. At, an in at industry event events or office events, uh, watch how much you drink. You know, I know and I was once a student and I went out in the business world and all of a sudden there was free alcohol everywhere. And uh, it's real easy to overindulge. And, you know, again, if some of you, some of you will probably be going to the REMS conference and there will be free flowing alcohol there if you're of age. And you've got to be careful not to overindulge. So a, a tactic that I use for that is I'll have a glass of wine or a cocktail, whatever I'm drinking, and then I have a glass of water, and I never have two alcoholic beverages in a row, and that's worked real well for me during my career, um, but uh, just keep that in mind, because you can either, if you get overly inebriated, people will notice that, and that will form an impression, and also, once you've had a little to drink, sometimes it's easier to say the, something that you regret later or do something you regret later. So that would be another um, item in there. And then lastly, and I won't go into a lot of detail on this because I want to move to my point number two, be careful about what you put on social media. And I'm sure you've all heard this many times. Um, but one thing that, that you might consider doing, this is the approach I've taken, and being an older guy, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm sure many of you use other social media, but I have a Facebook uh, account and I keep up with friends and family there, but I have no business connections in Facebook. And then I tighten down my security in Facebook um, to try to limit who can see anything. Not that I put all that much controversial stuff into Facebook, but I, but it, but it's my private place for just personal um, activities. And then I use LinkedIn for business. And I'll do, I have my business connections in LinkedIn. If I have a business connection, try to connect in Facebook, I tell them, thank you for, for thinking of me, but I, I keep all my business social media to LinkedIn and I'd be happy to connect with you there. And so that's the way I do it. Other people have other tactics, but bottom line is uh, social media can get you into a lot of trouble, as we've all seen in the news with uh, some celebrities and others that have gotten into trouble. So be careful what you do. <clears throat> My number two best practice is to build a reputation of integrity and trust. So this is a business in which others trust you with their money. And they entrust you with their reputation and they entrust you with their business success. And you've got to assure them that they can trust you 
and you have to develop that trust uh, and let them know that they can depend on you. So just remember your personal brand and your the ability and your integrity are are probably all one of the, probably the most important thing with respect to what people and the impression people have of you. Uh, so a couple of tips there: never lie. Don't even tell a little white lie, because if people catch you in a lie, then they're always going to wonder if you're telling the truth after that. Another tip is to never hide a mistake or an error. Um, own your mistakes. If you make a mistake, admit it and solve it or ask for help solving it. Don't try to sweep it under the rug or cover it up because inevitably when you try to hide a mistake, it tends to grow and fester. And then when, when it does come out and people find out about it, it's worse than it would have been if you'd just done something about it right away. Another point would be to always follow through on your word. As I said earlier, if you tell someone you're going to do something, do it. Uh, and then lastly, uh, steer clear of office gossip. You know, never have a, wor a bad word to say about anyone. Uh, it's a small world, and you very well could end up reporting to that person uh, um, one day. And, and the last thing you need is to have them not think well of you because you've said something bad of them. And then the other problem with uh, office gossip is the people you gossip with are not going to trust you either. Because if, you, if you're gossiping with them and talking about other people, then they're going to wonder if you're talking about them when you're with someone else and they're not going to trust you. So uh, a few pointers on that. But your, your reputation of integrity and trust, your personal brand is all important to career success. Okay, uh, tactic now or best practice number three, build a powerful network, professional network. Um, so your network can do potentially more for you than almost anything else in your career. Uh, personal networks, uh, in the professional area can help you get jobs, they can help you solve business problems, just innumerable things. Um, so it's really important to try to really work at and be proactive about building that network. Um, one of the things that you can use this in this day and age that I already mentioned is LinkedIn. It's really a powerful tool for building your network. And I think you should be proactive about using it. If you're a student and you don't have a LinkedIn account, get one and set up a LinkedIn profile. So you want to have a very professional LinkedIn profile with a biography, information about yourself, a, a professional photo, um, a pro, you know, professionally dressed looking photo, um, and set that up right away if you're a student or if you're already in business. Uh, and then actively seek to connect with peers and high performers. So if you're in school right now, look around at the people that you're in class with and think about who, who out of this group is likely to do well in their career and connect with them on LinkedIn. Because once you connect with them, you could very well be connected with them through the rest of your career. And it can help you build that relationship uh, and that you can work together on and help each other going forward in your career. But I would also say don't hesitate to invite people at higher levels uh, than you are to connect. Uh, executives and, and others in companies are very willing to connect on LinkedIn. And so just because someone is at a higher level than you are in an organization doesn't mean you should be timid about inviting them to connect with you. So I would suggest you do that. And, and those are the very people that later on could be helpful to you. And then once you have that set up, post something occasionally that's relevant and professional. And, you know, it might be a link to an article or a comment or something going on in the industry, but uh, post something professional occasionally to remind them because it'll show up in their feeds and then uh, it will remind them of who you are. <clears throat> 
So also in connection with uh, developing a uh, professional network is cultivate, cultivate a group of special content, contacts uh, that you can develop a deeper connection with. And some of this might be your classmates if you're in school or, or other, others once you're out of school in your organization and, you know, con or in other organizations even, and contact them and keep in touch with them occasionally. If they have problems, try to help them solve their problems because that'll make them more likely to help you. And I know early in my career, I helped uh, um, a consultant. At ERMI, we don't do risk management consulting, and I, but I was getting a lot of calls for people that were looking for consulting services, partic particularly expert witness work uh, around coverage disputes and insurance coverage disputes. And I, uh, I had a friend named Don Malecki and Don was just starting out on his own and I referred all of those to him. And he used to say, I helped him build his practice uh, through all the referrals, but I knew Don would do a good job for him. And, uh, and I did that. So he, he did more favors for me later on than I could ever uh, count. And, and it really developed a deep relationship with Don as a result. That's the type of thing that you can do with this uh, special group that I'm talking about. Then when you go to industry events, proactively network there, develop a game plan before you go to them. So if you're going to a, uh, you know, a regional, uh, say, CPCU meeting or a REMS meeting or something like that, you know, who's going to be at that meeting that you might want to develop a relationship with and try to find them and meet them and network with them. Uh, it's always good to have that type of a game plan before you go in. And if you can get the attendee list and know who's going to be there, that makes it even easier. <clears throat> My next point within this would be to seek out mentors who have experience and ask them for advice. Um, you know, Rachel mentioned this earlier. Mentors are really, really helpful to you in your career. And this would be a person or two or three that um, you develop a, a deep relationship with and will meet with you and talk with you and give you advice about whether it be about what to wear in the way of professional attire or uh, whether or not to make a career change or, or you know, whether or not to make a raise or, or ask for a raise or if you're going to, how to go about it, those types of things. Mentors can be really helpful for that. Uh, and so I would proactively, if I were you, reach out and, and, and ask people if they would be your mentor, uh, someone you respect and someone you, you trust and has the uh, core values that, uh, that you would uh, appreciate. <clears throat> I know a couple of people that have taken it a step further and have personal boards of directors. And what they've done is gone out and gotten three to five uh, people that they respect and asked them if they would be like a board of directors for them. And then they have um, every six months or maybe annually uh, a board of directors meeting with all of those people on a Zoom call or a team call or in person if they can. And, this, and, and these people show up and they say, well, here's some things I'm thinking about or some I, challenges I have, things like that. What is the advice? And they get this group talking about it, and they come out of that with really good advice as a result. So that takes that mentorship to a whole, whole nother level. I've been talking a lot. How about any questions or uh, comments from anyone? Am I talking too fast? <laughs> okay, well, let's keep going. Number four, I've got, I'm not quite halfway through and I'm halfway through my time, so I need to pick it up a little bit, I guess. Um, develop public speaking skills. Um, well, poll after poll has shown that public speaking is the most feared thing by Americans. Most Americans fear public speaking more than death. And I mean, it's true. It's, it's come out in polls. And so um, it is really a scary thing to a lot of people. But you make presentations all the time. Uh, in your career, you're going to be making them to your peers, 
You're going to be making them to your colleagues. You're going to make presentations to customers. You're going to, and, and, you know, as an example, if you're an agent or a broker, you're going to have to go in and present proposals and insurance programs and things like that to that, to your customers. If you're a manager and you have a team, you're going to have to present things to your team. So it's important that you develop certain skills around being able to do that. Uh, and if you look at presentations as an opportunity to build that personal brand I was talking about, you can take it even further and have opportunities to do public speaking at educational events and, and things like that. Um, so I'd say you need to get comfortable with public speaking at a, at a bare minimum. There's books out there. There's a ton of books on public speaking that you can read uh, and presentation, and you can get an idea from those. There's courses in LinkedIn Learning and other places. And, um, you know, there's classes. If you're still in school and there's a speech class, you might want to think about taking it, particularly if you're uh, very nervous about speaking. Um, and then the ultimate, I guess, is probably Toastmasters, which is like a club you can join and they do, they help their members in the club um, become better public speakers. So it, it's, it's something that Americans fear. I'm sure many people on this call are fearful of it. Um, it's, but it's, it's important and you do it all the time anyway. So you might as well uh, practice it a bit and develop some skills there. <clears throat> My next one would be to sharpen your knowledge with reliable re resources. So you're basically in, in insurance and risk management, you're a knowledge worker and you're working in a knowledge business or knowledge industry, you know, and as a result of that, your own personal knowledge is of risk and insurance is, you know, an absolute key to success. And it's imperative because of this that you include uh, continuing education in your daily routine. So my suggestion is to allocate part of every day to continuing education, whether it's, um, you know, reading an article, um, attending a webinar, um, um, going to a, a luncheon program with a educational speaker, any, any number of things that you can do. Um, reading a book, uh, taking uh, educational, uh, attending educational conferences, seminars, all those types of things. And, and if you do that, over time, you're gonna elevate your knowledge, obviously. <clears throat> Even though you do that, though, nobody can have intricate knowledge of all the areas of insurance and risk management. It is just, there's just too much to it. It changes constantly and it's very detailed and intricate. So it's also important to develop your ability to quickly find the information that you need to answer questions that you're going to encounter during the day and solve problems that you're going to run into on the job. Now, in this day and age, uh, the way you do that usually is turn to Google, right? And hop on the on Google and, and do some searches around keywords uh, related to your problem or, or the um, uh, issue that you're trying to, you need to learn more about, <clears throat> which is works pretty well for most things, but I wanna caution you about it, doing that with risk management and insurance. It's, it's so specialized and so detailed, it, you've got to be careful about trusting what you find on that topic on the internet. Um, and so let me give you some examples. Uh, you know, you could find an article that appears to be really good, but it was written five years ago and it's out of date. You know, insurance changes, policy forms are changing constantly. There's new case law. Uh, deciding how policies uh, apply or don't apply, uh, and then just different trends in the legal environment. All these things can make an article quickly out of date. The other thing you run into is bias in, in the content that you find on the internet. 
So you've got to remember that usually free content that you find on the internet is there for marketing purposes, right? Whoever wrote it's trying to get attention uh, for themselves or their employer and also trying maybe to build a personal brand and, and some of these other things that we've been talking about. Well, as a result, those pieces, that content is going to be biased um, towards whatever their bias is. So let me give you one example, and that is uh, with respect to coverage, insurance coverage, and interpretations of how a policy provision might apply. And so um, in, in this country, there's a whole group of lawyers called coverage lawyers, ironically, <laughs> that specialize in uh, litigating insurance coverage. Now, usually, not always, but often these people, these lawyers will um, focus on either the insurance company side or the policyholder side. So there's policyholder coverage lawyers and insurance company coverage lawyers out there. And if you find an articles, and I'll just pick a topic, uh, construction defects. So there's a lot of um, uh, controversy about how general liability policies apply or don't apply when a contractor uh, defectively constructs something and then it falls or doesn't work or whatever. Well, a policyholder attorney is gonna be biased towards finding coverage. So that person's article is likely to make all the arguments that they would make in a, in a case about why the policy should cover the loss or does cover the loss. Then the insurance company lawyer writing about the same exact issue is gonna look at it from the other perspective of all the reasons it wouldn't be covered. And so depending on which one of those two articles you find, you're gonna get a biased uh, interpretation potentially. If you find and read them both, then maybe you can splice that knowledge together and come up with uh, what you think is right, but uh, it's something to be careful about. But so how do you deal with that? Most major insurance organizations, insurance companies, brokers, agencies, as well as most uh, risk management departments subscribe to online reference content that is much more detailed and reliable than what you will find on the open internet. Um, and generally, you'll find answers to your questions faster in these services than you would by just going to Google and typing in words. Um, and usually once you get out and start working, your employer is, is going to have that, you know, resource available to you. Um, and this is an area where my company, ERMI, can be of help to you. So we publish a 40,000 page online library of property and casualty information. It's constantly updated by a team of 15 knowledgeable research analysts who are, um, like I say, very knowledgeable and they're unbiased. And we cover, uh, our content is available on a variety of industry information platforms. One of those is ERMI Online. Um, if you're in school and you're a member of Gamma Oda Sigma, you have free access to ERMI Online as a member benefit. And we sent out an email a few weeks ago to professors around the country, reminding them of how, how you can sign up. So be sure to ask your professor about that and get familiar with the ERMI content that's available to you uh, so that when you go out into the, when you begin working, you'll be able to see that uh, uh, you'll already be familiar with it and know how to use it. Uh, but our content's also available through a service called Vertifor Reference Connect that a lot of insurance companies and brokers subscribe to, as well as another service called Zywave. So our content's available in a number of areas, as are as content from our competitors. And I recommend that you get you find out if you have these resources uh, from your employer and you use them because you're going to get better answers faster than just Googling. So my number six uh, best practice. Any questions or comments? 
Jack, I was curious on the sort of on the daily, you're, you know, that you started off by this number, what are we on five, on yeah. allocating a part of your day to educate yourself on something other than your ERMI resources or in addition to what, what's your go-to podcast or your go-to publication for just reading little daily snippets to, to keep up with the times? Sure. Well, um, one would be business insurance and it's, Ever since I started in the business, that that was sort of the magazine that that um, most risk management insurance people um, read. Now that's more it's newsier things, right? But they also have you no know, cover conferences and and other things like that. Um, and then there's another publication called um, um, Risk and Insurance Magazine. Uh, which is similar and competes with business insurance. And then RIMS, of course, has a, um, its uh, database and, and content. If you're a RIMS member, and I'm not, I mean, you could maybe answer this, Rachel, but I think Gamma students get a RIMS membership or there's a way to get a student membership. Uh, that would be another thing. ERMI actually has uh, five free newsletters as well, email newsletters that you can subscribe to. Um, that uh, have then links into the ERMI content. So, you know, if you have an ERMI online subscription and you subscribe to the ERMI newsletters, it would have summaries of some of the content there and links links that would take you into it. Um, so those are a few examples. Let me think what else I would suggest there. I guess off the top of my head, those those would be my main ones. That's great. Think, Thanks, Jack. You bet. You bet. So my next tip would be, or best practice would be to get certified, get a certification. So as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, continuing education is really important and you can leverage your continuing education efforts into an even more credibility by pursuing one or more risk management or insurance uh, designations or certifications. And these are really valuable when you're young because you know, they're evidence that you've developed um, and established a level of expertise. So when I, when I graduated from Georgia decades ago and I was a risk management consultant, usually the, um, I was consulting for the clients I was consulting for, I was younger than the clients and I was younger than their insurance brokers Yet I was trying, I was giving them advice on how to manage risk. And um, it, it was very helpful. I had, as was mentioned in my biography, I got CPCU, most of which I completed while I was in college. Um, in fact, the entire thing I completed while I was in college, but I had to wait because there was an experience requirement. But I had CPCU early on. I got the ARM certification early on. And by having that on my business card, it helped get that additional credibility uh, for a young person to be, to, for people to believe I might know what I was talking about. Um, so it's really helpful then. If you're in college, um, you really should start trying to at least take one or two of these if you can to, uh, to get started. Um, there's general, there's what I call generalist de designations and there's more specialist types designations. So a generalist designation would be something that applies to like all industries and across lines of coverage. And the best two examples of these are CPCU, which stands for Chartered Property Casualty Underwriter and CIC, which is Certified Insurance Counselor. Um, I consider the CPCU to be the premier PNC industry designation and it's probably the most difficult uh, to obtain, but CIC is a close second, and I'm sure there's people that would disagree with me on which of those is more pre prestigious than the other. Um, but those would be generalist um, certifications. Then you've got specialist ones that might be in a line of coverage or in an industry or an area. So some examples of that are ARM, which is Associate in Risk Management, CRM, which is Certified Risk Manager. And then ERMI also has uh, five uh, 
certifications, four industry ones, and one that's special that's focused on uh, um, employment, um, executive liability. But we have one for the construction industry, one for the energy industry, one's focused on agribusiness and farm, and then another on transportation. So those are your more specialist types of, of certifications. Um, you through your classwork, you're probably prepared to take and pass some of these exams. And uh, I strongly urge you to uh, talk to your professors about it and get some suggestions there of, of which way to go. But it really will help build your resume for when you're looking for a job. And also it will give you that st head start towards obtaining the certifications when you get out. So you don't have to start from ground zero. <clears throat> okay, my next one, number seven is be mobile. You know, to maximize your career potential, you really ought to be willing to relocate to where the opportunities are. Um, I know a lot of young people come out of school want to stay close to home or in their home state or have some particular place they want to go. If you do, a, if you're willing to move, um, you can potentially get a better job or a job more suited to you. Um, so I would suggest you be flexible about where you live and look for the best opportunities you can find. When I got out of Georgia, I would have liked to have probably gone to work in Atlanta, frankly, but I wanted to be a risk management consultant and there weren't that many risk management consulting firms around and I sent my resume to every one of them and I ended up working for one in Dallas, Texas and I've been here ever since and I'm glad to be here. It's a great place to live. But um, if I hadn't been willing to move, I would have ended up doing something else and my career would have gone totally differently than where it's gone. Hopefully it would have been a good career, but who knows? Uh, but I know a lot of people that have been successful in this business. For example, the chief content officer at Ermi, and he's worked all over the country and all over the world as he's moved up through different organizations. And um, so I would advise you to consider at least moving. If you get an opportunity for a good job in another place or a promotion or, or whatever it might be, uh, pursue those opportunities. So number eight, I see I've got about 10 minutes left, so I better hurry it up. Show up with solutions. <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of people will show up in their manager's office with a problem and say, I've got this problem. And then they sit and wait on the manager to tell them how to solve it. That's not going to impress your boss. Okay. What will impress your boss is if you think about the problem ahead of time and come up with what you think might be a couple of ways to solve the problem and go in and say, I have this problem, Rachel, you know, and here's my problem. I've been thinking about it and this might be a way to solve it, but I'm not sure if this will work or not. Can you give me any advice? You know, is this a good idea or, or have you got some other options? That's going to impress your boss a lot more than just dumping your problem in, in their lap and what's called really upward delegation, right? Uh, so, uh, show up when you've got a problem with a possible solution, or at least have thought about it enough to be able to have a conversation with your boss about it. <clears throat> Number nine, take care of yourself. So your mental, physical, and financial well-being are really important to career success and importantly, your overall happiness in life. And I think, at least for me, when I started out in my career, I was so career focused uh, that, and I moved to a new city. I didn't have a physician here. I didn't have a dentist here. Um, I used to walk all over campus when I was at Georgia and got exercise there. I had no exercise program when I, I, I was just work, 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 right? And, uh, as a result of that, I had some health issues later in life. Uh, nothing too serious, but um, but I had some. And also gained weight and I had to lose some weight and, and what have you. So it's important that you think about your, your health 
mental health, your physical health, uh, and your financial health, and and keep it, you know, stay healthy. <laughs> and and so I would suggest, you know, find an exercise routine that you can sustain. You, you know, incorporating it into your daily routine really helps. For me, uh, I have a personal trainer I see twice a week. And by having that appointment, I can't uh, rationalize, oh, I need to finish this project at the office before I, and, and so I'm going to blow off uh, going to work out. I have to go and I'm going to pay the guy whether I show up or not. So I show up. Uh, but different people have different ways of doing it. Having a partner to exercise with is another one. Um, another point here for mental health uh, is use your paid time off, use your vacation. A lot of people go to work and they skip vacations. Um, and it's, it's important to get away and recharge. I tell our employees this all the time. You've got the paid time off for a reason. Take it, use it, go on vacation, go do something and get your mind off the work, off work. And I recommend when you do that, that you try to avoid taking phone calls, avoid email. A lot of business people can't do that, but I think it's really important. I make it a point to take at least two weeks a year and, and I do not do email. I do not, I don't call the office. I, I, they know how to get me. And if it's an extreme emergency, they'll call me. I've never had it happen, but they will. And that's the kind of vacation where you can really recharge the batteries. It can be hard to do, but it's, I think, important to do. Um, manage your finances, develop a budget, stick to your budget, minimize your debt. You know, debt is not your friend. And, uh, you know, you, particularly when you get out of school, you're going to have a lot of opportunities for credit cards and other, other stuff. I've always considered credit card debt as evil. I avoid, I've avoided it all my life. And a lot of people get in trouble with credit cards. So just, uh, you know, develop a budget, stick with your budget. Don't spend money you don't have. You know, car loans are okay, but you know, over the, over your career, at some point, it would be good if you can get to the point where you're not having to borrow money for cars. Um, build an emergency fund. You should have three to six months of living expenses in liquid cash in a bank account or something at some point um, soon after you start your career, so that if you get laid off or we have a pandemic and everything shuts down or whatever it might be. Uh, it's just a risk management tactic, right? You've got that uh, emergency fund there that you can fall back on. And then pay yourself, contribute to your 401k, max it out, because particularly when you're young, that time value of money, and I'm sure you've studied it in finance classes or other places, but the time value of money really adds up. And um, uh, you can have a lot of money by the time you're ready to retire. So take advantage of that 401k plan that you're likely to have. And number 10, work toward annual goals. Um, set personal and professional goals every year around all the things I've been talking about. Um, and then plan to hit those goals. Now, the thing about that, about annual goals is most people don't hit them. And, the reason they don't is because most of the, most people have basically a 90 day attention span. So you said, you know, at the beginning of the year, they set at New Year's resolutions and by March, they've forgotten what they even were, right? Uh, January and February, it starts off great. And then you forget, and you see this all the time at the gym. Oh, I'm gonna go exercise. So you, if you're a member of a gym, the, the number of people working out doubles in January and then it's down a little bit in February and by um, April or May it's back down to what it was in December. Um, so the way to deal with that is quarterly objectives that are aimed towards hitting your annual goals. So at the beginning of the year you set your goals and you also set three to seven quarterly objectives that build toward your annual goals. And then at the end of the first quarter, you tabulate how you did on those three to seven and you set new ones for the second quarter. And you, again, base those on your annual goals. And then you do the same thing in the third quarter and the fourth quarter. And by the end of the year, you hit your annual goals. So let me give you an example of how I use this tactic. 
uh, each quarter, one of my well, one of my objectives is to have a meaningful conversation or in-person meeting with one of our, with four of our major customers. Um, so this could be like an insurance company executive or a brokerage company executive that subscribes to ERMI content or is a sponsor for our conferences or something like that. <clears throat> so if, by the, if I do that, uh, I set four a quarter, by the end of the year, I will have met my annual goal of 16 to 20 customer conversations. If I just said 20 conversations in January, what probably would happen is come um, November, December, I'd realize I'd only done four of them and I'd have 16 more to try to squeeze in. So just keep in mind that that quarterly uh, cadence uh, is really useful. We, it, I feel so strongly about it. We do this at my company. We set annual goals and then we have quarterly, what we call rocks. Um, and I, 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 there's a reason it's called that, which I won't go into right now, but uh, for time, but, uh, and we have, and, but we do those each quarter so that we hit our annual goals by the end of the year. So I've got about one minute left here. If I can take any other questions or uh, um, anybody want to offer anything. Anything? I'll say something. I just want to say thank you for your time. Um, you shared a lot of insightful information. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yes, well, let me uh, just uh, close by um, uh, just a couple of points here. So you guys are working in a truly great industry. You know, the entire reason for being of this industry is to help people when they need help the most. And you should be really proud of that. And uh, I mean, just really proud of it. It's also an industry where you can achieve great financial success and career success while doing good for the world. And I hope uh, my 10 best practices are gonna help you do that. I do have a handout that has all of these best practices as well as some others on it. That I'd be happy to email to you if you wanna send me an email at jack.g at ermy.com. That's jack.g at ermy.com. And I'll put it in the chat here in a sec, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll be happy to email that handout to you. I'd also be happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. So you can uh, maybe do a little more of that uh, network building I was talking about. So you can uh, just search for my name on LinkedIn and find me there if you'd like, and I'll connect with you there. So let me thank you all for your attention. Uh, I do hope it's uh, been useful to you and uh, I wish you all uh, a great deal of career success. Jack, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate your time. I wanna just thank you on behalf of, of the Spencer Educational Foundation. And likewise, I wanna thank everyone who is in attendance today for being here. Um, it's funny, so Jack Wright brought up a lot about personal branding. We have uh, another webinar coming up next month that I just wanted to bring up here uh, on October 14th on what is your personal brand? So I hope you'll come to that. And um, that'll be with leaders from the Markel Corporation. Um, um, so it'll be a great follow-up to Jack's topic today so you can dive more into that. Um, and likewise, please connect with me on LinkedIn. You have my email. Send me an email if you have any questions. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining. Take care, everyone. Thank you. See ya. Well, thank you.